Okay. Well, it is uh, eight o'clock, and uh, I think it's time for us to uh, kick off this session. Uh, so, welcome those who are here um, to this uh, e sensitivity mapping session. We are uh, actually going to do a demo of our mapping tool, Abbey Step, this evening. Um, my name is Duncan Lang from the ADB's. Uh, environment thematic group. I do work for another department in ADB, which is uh, why I sound a bit uh, unsure. But um, uh, the main, the where I'm representing today is through the environment thematic group. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're doing a live demo of this uh, e-sensitivity mapping tool. Uh, it's called AviStep, and that stands for the Avian Sensitivity Tool for Energy Planning. And you will hear a bit more in a minute from. Uh, Tris as to why we've given it that name. So the format of the session today, I will give some very brief introduction, and then you will get followed with that, a demonstration session, uh, which will be facilitated by Beatrice Gomez from ADB and Tris Allenson from BirdLife International, who will be the demonstrator. We will then have a moderated Q&A session. So before I let uh, Beatrice and Tris loose, with the mapper, I better introduce them. Uh, so, if I can give a quick bio of Tris, um, if you listened to the launch session earlier today, this will you'll have heard this before, but let me give it again in case of those who weren't attending. So, Tris leads bird life's work on the impacts of energy infrastructure on birds, and he is a world expert in the development of spatial planning tools to facilitate renewable a responsible energy expansion. Tris works closely with governments, international financial institutions and energy sector to ensure that Avian data are effectively integrated within the renewable energy planning process. And Tris is also the chair of the technical working group of the Convention on Migratory Species Energy Task Force. Uh, Beatrice is a senior safeguards officer working with ADB's private sector investment teams and clients to design and implement projects in compliance with ADB safeguard policies and requirements. Her work includes the assessment and oversight of projects in energy, transport, water, agriculture, urban development, and finance sectors across Asia. Prior to ADB, Beatrice worked as an environmental scientist specializing in contaminated site assessment and remediation. So with that, um, I can now turn over to uh, Tris and Beatrice to give us the live demo of the Abbey Step mapper. So, both of you, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you, Duncan. I'll just um, move to get the uh, mapper on the screen. Great, so I hope now everyone can uh, can see the tool. This is the homepage of the tool that you're seeing on the screen. Um, so the tool isn't currently live on the website, uh, although if you go to the website, you'll see this homepage with a message saying the tool is coming soon. So uh, please do bookmark that page. The, the page is at https uh, uh, double slash avistep.birdlife.org. Um, and if you go there, you can bookmark that page and the tool will go fully live, we expect in mid July, uh, and we'll send out reminders ahead of that date so that people can go back and look at the tool for themselves. Um, so this is a sneak preview of that tool. Uh, most of the functionality is there. We just need to do our final um, quality control testing to make sure everything's right before we go fully live with it. Um, and the, the purpose um, of, of this session is to really get to look really deeply into our step and explain how it works and how we intend for people to use it uh, and how it will be used. So as uh, Duncan said, the tool is Avastep, something AVI for avian and STEP, the sensitive tool for energy planning. But also STEP is intended as a sort of allusion to the fact that we really uh, are aspiring for this tool to become um, a critical step, an essential step and ensuring that there is a safe and truly nature safe uh, transition to renewable energy. 
So whilst uh, with the support of uh, ADB, we've developed this tool and are launching it, and it covers four countries, four key emerging markets in, uh, in, in Asia, India, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. The aim is that we've, we've built a platform and we've devised a methodology that has the potential to be spread uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and so we hope to very rapidly scale it up, working with ADB and others to expand it in Asia, but also looking for partners in other parts of the world, principally in Africa and Latin America, where we can also roll out this tool. Um, we think it provides a, a really important um, part in enabling us to, uh, um, to meet our, um, our renewable energy targets rapidly and in a nature safe way. So just to give you a little bit of a, a, an overview of the tool, you can either go and get started and look, go straight to the map viewer, or you can learn more, which takes you through to the various supplementary static pages. So there's a about Avistat page, which explains you know, the background to the project, why this kind of sensitivity mapping um, is so important. Still to come here, we're going to insert a promotional video and promotional brochure that people are able to access and download through this site. There's then the how to use Avistep page. This too will have a video here that will be a small video tutorial, which will talk people through how to use the site. And we recommend that first time users uh, review that video tutorial. There's then an overview of the methodology, but also uh, ultimately there will be a detailed technical manual that you can download. So we've designed Avistep to be very intuitive and easy to, to use, but underlying that there's some really complex science um, that, that has gone into developing these maps and uh, anyone who was interested in understanding all of the detail about how we've gone about doing these assessments we're going to find that in that technical manual and then we have our acknowledgements page um, linking to the various supporters who've made this possible and the project partners we've worked with uh, to make this project possible and some of their sort of affiliates related websites and data providers um, as well, as well as a contacts page, and you'll be able to get in touch with, with us through Avistep at birdlife.org to, uh, to get in touch and ask questions about the tool. That web, that uh, email link will be active very soon. You can navigate through these pages um, at the top bar and at any point head back to the main site. Um, and so I'll just show how that works. Then we press get started. And we zoom in from the globe into our area that we're interested in, um, in Asia. And so at the moment, uh, we have our four countries, India, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam. We've designed this very much that we can add new countries and ultimately we'll add a regional selection layer. So first you'll select Asia, Africa, et cetera, and then go to the countries as and when we add more countries. You can access these countries via here or clicking on them directly in the map. It's a sort of normal mapping interface that allows you to move around, zoom in and out using the mouse and cursor. You can also move in and out with those buttons and you can move to different mapping views. So away from the satellite imagery to look at um, some uh, different uh, mapping backgrounds. It has a uh, very quick uh, search function. So if you want to search for a site by name, so if I put in um, Ritza, uh, a city in, famous city in Punjab, it very quickly zooms in on Amritsar. We can uh, confirm that is Amritsar by seeing, yes, there's the golden temple of Amritsar. Uh, it also, you can, um, put in a, uh, a, a, a grid reference. So often for sites uh, that are being screened by ADB and others, they'll be given a grid reference. You can put that site in and click and it immediately zooms to that site. In this case, I've put in the, uh, the grid reference for the Taj Mahal in, 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 Ag in Agra. So it has a very uh, quick and uh, responsive um, search facility. and then go back to look at a sort of global level view. This looks great, Chris. It, it runs so smoothly on my end. 
Um, can you show us how um, we can check uh, the avian sensitivity in relation to onshore wind projects? Yes, sure. So um, on the left hand menu panel here, we have the different types of energy uh, energy infrastructure for which we've developed uh, um, sensitivity maps. So we have onshore wind, offshore wind, solar photovoltaic, and then power lines, both the low voltage distribution lines and the high voltage transmission lines, which affect uh, birds in slightly different ways. So to see onshore wind uh, for India, we would click here and up comes the sensitivity across India. And so you can see uh, here, it very quickly puts it in uh, uh, the sensitivity in four categories, ranging from low sensitivity, moderate sensitivity, high sensitivity, and very high sensitivity. In the accompanying static pages, there are definitions of what we mean by each of those categories, and how they should be interpreted. Um, and it says exactly what a um, square kilometer area falls within each of these categories and what percentage that is. You can see 22% of India is low sensitivity, and low avian sensitivity in relation to onshore wind, 34% moderate, 28% high, and 60% very high. But of Yeah, and but um, not all areas will be suitable for wind energy, right? Is there a way to screen areas out? Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, although we're, prevent we're, we're showing a sensitivity across every um, square kilometer of India, the, re the reality is that many areas won't be feasible for, for wind. So we've also uh, modeled the available wind across uh, the regions. And so using this toggle here, suitable wind speed areas only, you can toggle there and it removes all of those areas which don't actually have suitable wind speeds. So this is effectively, uh, those areas that uh, their annual average wind speeds at 100 meter height, comparable to the heights of uh, wind turbine hubs, where they have uh, average meters of five meters per second, which is regarded as sort of the industry uh, um, standard of wind speed above which you need uh, to have in order to have viable uh, wind development. And so, you know, there are lots of other factors that will uh, be at play as to whether you can develop um, um, wind rather than not just the wind speed you know you know uh, there are lots of other factors but they vary greatly between countries different countries will have different regulations about how far from urban areas you can put wind farms how far from um, um, airports for example what elevation you can put wind farms so we can't take account of those but the one thing that is is generally regarded as an industry standard is the need for those minimum wind speeds so this gives you a very good idea of those areas and the numbers adjust as well. So you can see these numbers are now adjusted, the total area available and the percentages to just those areas within India, which have sufficiently high um, wind speeds in order to make wind, um, wind energy possible. Would it be possible to look at this as a, at the regional scale instead of as a on a country scale? Yes, so as well as seeing this as a, a country, we can also uh, zoom into the state or province level. So if we zoom in here into the state of Karnataka uh, in southern India, then it then pulls in just that information um, and again, adjust the figures here again. So you can see in this state, actually, there's, a, there's only a, quite a small percentage of the area which is high or very highly sensitive, only 14% uh, of the state is high or very high, and 85% is low or moderate, suggesting that this is a state where there's huge potential to expand wind energy. Um, and you know, if you wanted to, to share this information with somebody, you could, and you wanted to show them, say, just those areas uh, which were low or moderate, you could remove the areas for high and very high and share a link. And that link would go to them and allow them to come straight to this view that we're seeing. So, so you could say, hey, you know, look at all the areas that are, uh, have low and moderate sensitivity to birds um, and are, have high uh, suitable wind speeds in Karnataka. Um, you know, th um, th this looks like a, a good area to consider um, large scale wind um, development. I can see how it would be useful. Uh, the, the tool is useful for national and regional planning. If we want to zero in on a particular location, how would we do that? Yes, so then when we, uh, when we zoom in, 
on the map, uh, when you get to a certain resolution, it reveals the, the, uh, the grid squares. And so we've done this assessment down to a grid resolution of five kilometers by five kilometers. Each one of these squares is five uh, kilometers by, by five kilometers, a very low resolution, and a very applicable resolution to the scale of renewable energy development. You can uh, make that layer more or less transparent so you can still see the underlying geography. And then when you zoom in, you can zoom in on a square um, and find out um, the assessment of the sensitivity for this particular square. So now it's generating that assessment in the right hand panel here. And we'll just give it a second to, uh, to come up with that. That's coming up. And so what it's saying that this particular um, area um, is very high sensitivity, 100% sensitivity, and that means the sensitivity assessed is assessed as very high. Development is considered to be to pose a very high risk to bird populations. However, comprehensive site level assessment is still necessary to confirm this level of risk. But it does appear that this area is highly sensitive. And the reason for that, one, we have sensitive sites that intersect with this site. So it's an important bird area and a protected area. Um, and you can click through um, on those to see the, uh, the important bird area fact sheet for this site on BirdLife's website or the official uh, protected area um, um, fact sheet on the protected area um, database. You can also see what are the species that contribute to this site. So here are a list of all of the species that are present um, within this square. Um, some of them we're still yet to uh, add the photos in for. Um, but you can see in, in where there's not a photo, it shows the uh, red list status and soon we'll have photos for all of those. And so this list, uh, starting with the most sensitive, the, uh, the, most, uh, the species that are there. So at the top, you've got white rumped vulture, 100% sensitivity, one of the most sensitive birds to wind energy infrastructure, followed by Indian spotted eagle, 77% sensitivity, going uh, right all the way down to some of the lesser sensitive species. Um, and you've also got a measurement of confidence. So we've also um, got a measure here of how confident we are that that bird actually occurs within this square. So sites that have a very high confidence is because we've actually got an observational record, a recent observational record of this species in this square. So we know with you know, really quite some certainty that the species does occur there. The medium sensitive sites, these are sites where we don't have an observation record, but the site falls within the modeled uh, habitat range and elevation range for that species. So it's the right habitat, the right elevation within the species range, so a, very, so, so a medium likelihood would be there. Where it's just a low likelihood, that means it falls within the wider um, species range, but not necessarily uh, you know, is the right habitat. And then finally, we have the land cover information. So using high resolution satellite land cover imagery, we've been able to come up with a, a, an assessment of the land cover for, for this area. So this particular um, grid square is 81% forest and 18% cultivated. Um, and, this, the, and all of these factors contribute to the score. So we've weighted, um, important habitats like forest and wetlands uh, with greater value. We have weighted, obviously, each of the species in terms of their um, risk, and then sites that are important bird areas and protected areas automatically trigger the highest category. And so all of these factors go into an algorithm that together gives you your overall sensitivity for this site. And are you able to generate a report of this, Tris, for this, for this square? Yes, that's right. So as well as being able to share this information through the share link, you can actually also print off a PDF report which has all of this information in it. So you click on the generate a report button up in the top uh, and it produces a report which combines all of this information. So first you get maps, um, um, maps at a large scale showing where exactly in the, in the country the area is a detailed map of the actual site, information on those protected areas and IBAs that uh, it overlaps with, and then the full list of all the species, giving uh, uh, what species are there, how sensitive they are, and what the confidence that we are that those species are present. So that long list of all those species, 
and then that breakdown of the land cover sensitivity. And this, along with that assessment of, uh, of sensitivity and what we suggest that means. So someone can very easily output this, uh, this PDF and have a very good early um, provisional understanding of the, of the um, biodiversity importance of a site uh, that can influence their further decision making process. Yeah. And can you can you give us a little bit of detail on how a planner, developer, or a lender such as ADB can interpret this assessment? Yeah, so it's an assessment like this that is looking at a very high sensitive site. Um, this is suggesting this site is likely to have a very sensitive uh, is very sensitive to wind energy infrastructure, and it would pose a significant risk to bird populations. Um, this grid square. Is a protected area at least in part and an iba and as we saw there were uh, several very high risk species like white rump vulture indian spotted eagle um, and a high proportion of the area is covered with a wildlife wildlife rich uh, habitat forest so altogether you know this might it would be advisable perhaps to consider an alternative location especially if, if you know when you zoom out and you can see there are lots of uh, more preferable areas are only a short distance away. So hopefully, you know, this would, this would allow planners and lenders to kind of um, steer their development away from these areas to the, to the more, um, to, the, to the less problematic sites. But I mean, even if planners and developers and lenders do intend to proceed at a location like this, at least they've been forewarned about the potential for wildlife conflict. And they'll be able, they'll be alert to the fact that development of a site like this, if it is possible, it is probably going to require um, quite a high level of mitigation. And therefore, you know, they're going to have to be aware of that moving forward. So, um, you know, I, I guess ultimately, whatever the predicted sensitivity, you would still need to do a comprehensive environmental impact assessment. Um, in a sense, you know, this is a bit like the initial wind prospecting that is done with wind resource maps. So anyone who's involved in developing wind farms or solar facilities will know that you start off with a map of at a national scale of where the most suitable wind speeds are and, or solar radiation and use that to identify initial sites for investigation. But when you've then chosen the site, you then have to install a meteorological tower and collect meteorological data to confirm that that wind speed is in fact correct. And in this, the, the, the sensory maps work in a very similar way. This gives you that initial sense um, assessment, which will go a long way to steer you towards uh, the better areas, just as wind maps steer you towards uh, the high wind areas, this map will steer you towards the high wind areas and low biodiversity impact areas, therefore hopefully allowing for more rapid and straightforward uh, um, expansion of wind uh, and other infrastructure. Um, but you still have to do an environmental impact assessment to confirm that uh, that, um, that assessment is correct and to identify what mitigation measures might need to be put in place. But ultimately having this kind of early um, indication of what, the, of what the risk is will make development process smoother and simpler um, and, and hopefully speed up and allow us to get to achieve our renewable energy goals quicker. Yeah, thank you. That, that's understood. Um, so could we see an, an example for offshore wind, you think? Yeah, so if I move back out to India at a global scale, and then I can go from offshore wind and bring up the map for offshore wind. Um, So yes, yeah, so now we're seeing the map for um, offshore wind. And um, again, this is kind of, they, they, these are sort of shows, these are kind of analyses that have never been done before. So um, we're, we're, we're really understanding patterns of avian sensitivity that no one's um, looked into before. And we have a real help in being able to plan offshore wind uh, um, in a sensible way in these countries. So as you can see, there seems to be a lot more sensitivity uh, to the west of India than there is um, in the Bay of Bengal. Um, and then when we actually toggle on suitable wind speeds, we see there's actually this very, there's actually a much reduced area of offshore area in India that has sufficient wind speeds. So for offshore wind, 
it's uh, generally regarded that you need annual average uh, wind speeds of 100 meter height of above seven meters uh, per second. And um, the only areas really in, in India that, that have those sufficient wind speeds are some areas around Gujarat up in the north, down um, between uh, uh, southern India and Sri Lanka, uh, but also um, a large area here on the uh, on the east coast. And immediately we can see that you know perhaps particularly when floating wind uh, starts to take off, and that's a technology still under development, but is expected that when floating wind comes about, which will not be very long from now, that is going to be the real driver of expansion of, of wind in Asia, um, then this area here is immediately jumping out as an area that could be really, really critical to the expansion of offshore wind um, in India and doing so in a safe way. Um, and then if we sort of zoom in to have a little look about these assessments, I'll just show you the assessment, one of these assessments. So here is the offshore assessment for this area um, off, the, uh, off the coast of India. And this site, again, very highly sensitive. It's a protected area, the Gulf of Manal protected area, has a long list of sensitive species. And for seabirds, we have two measurements of sensitivity, both a score for collision and a score for displacement. For, for, for seabirds, um, these are both equally important, really, both the, the, uh, the risk they pose of collision, but also the risk of being displaced from an area because they don't like to enter certain, certain areas that have lots of wind farms in them. Um, and then we also have imported information on other sensitive features, such as seagrass, coral reefs, and mangrove uh, forests. And so you can see that this site uh, it is home to significant areas of seagrass and coral reefs. It has a long list of uh, sensitive uh, seabirds that are present here, and it's also a protected area. So immediately, uh, if, you were, uh, if you were asked to sort of um, consider um, investing in development at this site, you may wish to be cautious in doing so, because there's a lot of evidence to suggest this would be a sensitive site to put an offshore development. That's great, Tris. Um, how about we move to Thailand now and look at the sensitivity in relation to solar energy? Yeah, great. So uh, moving from India to Thailand. Um, I'll just go in again right from the start, just so, just so we see the swirling globe one more time. But uh, also it helps just to clear that we haven't uh, cached any information from India. We always start in Thailand. So yeah, if I select Thailand and then solar voltaics, this is the map that we're seeing for, um, for solar. And once again, we can see that assessment at national level, get the full breakdown of how the sensitivity is distributed between the categories and the, and the area um, of sensitivity in each category. And again, we can click to see just that sensitivity in those areas which have suitable um, solar resource. In terms of um, suitable global um, solar resource, what we're looking for is global horizontal uh, irradiation, which is above 1400, um, which is above 1400 kilowatts per meter squared. That's what is generally regarded as the as the minimum you need in order to have commercially viable um, solar PV technology. And actually you can see that when we filter onto that for Thailand, it removes very little from the map. So really a great deal of Thailand is sufficiently um, sunny for, for there to be uh, viable to have um, um, solar PV installed. And again, we can zoom in to a particular um, um, province. We can um, zoom in on an area and look at an area and see why this area is coming out as being high sensitivity for solar facilities. Uh, this site is, is sensitive. So one important thing to say for the solar is um, unlike wind farms where there are particular types of birds, particular groups of birds that are particularly susceptible to collision, 
So certain birds, because of their morphology and behavior, have a heightened risk of collision with turbine blades, or indeed collision uh, or electrocution on power lines. There aren't really um, a group of birds that are more likely to collide with solar um, panels. There is a little bit of evidence from North America that some water birds can mistake solar panels for large bodies of water, something called the lake effect, and they will fly towards them and collide. But that's really a phenomenon that's only been seen in some desert areas of uh, the southern United States. So in general, there isn't any sort of reason to, to think of some species being more sensitive than others. So for our solar um, uh, assessments, we don't include a measurement of the species uh, sensitivity there. The assessment is based purely on an assessment of whether there were sensitive sites, affected areas, IBAs, and whether what the land cover sensitivity is. So this area is coming out as very highly sensitive because it's a uh, protected area, uh, and also because when you look at the breakdown of the land cover, it is half of it is uh, it, 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 more than half of it, nearly sixty percent is forest, um, although half of it, the other half is cultivated area. So this is why this area uh, is coming out as highly sensitive for solar in Thailand. Cool. Um... So you mentioned power lines just a while ago. Can we look at an assessment for power lines, maybe with using Nepal as an example? Yeah, I will uh, move over to Nepal. So there's Nepal, Nepal showing for solar. And if we uh, move uh, to distribution lines, hopefully it will regenerate the map for that. And, uh, This is, uh, I will just um, go through the home page again. So it um, does that. Seems to be a small glitch that is on the list of things to uh, to iron out before the uh, the full launch. There's still time, Chris. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then, if we yeah, go to Nepal and click on distribution power lines. So these are the low voltage lines that, uh, that you see across the country. And again, you're seeing the sensitivity broken down um, across the whole country. I mean, actually very little of Nepal is low or moderate and a very high uh, percentage is, is high or very high. And I think one of the points to make about power lines as opposed to wind and solar with wind and solar, I think one of the key messages is there is a lot of areas out there that have suitable wind and solar and are low or moderate sensitivity. We should really prioritize those areas. So given that we have a choice of where we can put wind and solar, let's prioritize those areas where we're not gonna have um, problems with, with, uh, with biodiversity. For power lines, um, that's not so much the case. I mean, we can't put all of Nepal's power lines just up in the, uh, in the northwest corner. We need power lines everywhere. Power lines are a feature. We need power lines to link up every village and town and, and, and so forth. So this is the assessments are, are less about sort of showing areas where you can, can put power lines and more about making sure that we're informed when we're developing power lines in those regions of what the risk is. If we're um, pre-warned about what the level of risk is and why there's a risk there, then we can make sure we're uh, working in effective mitigation into our power line design um, from the outset. So again, uh, you can zoom in on a particular um, region of Nepal here, um, looking at East Nepal, and once again, kind of zoom in on a site um, and, and look at that and say, you know, why is this particular site coming out as very sensitive for power lines, for distribution power lines? Um, and again, this site, um, in, important to note that for the power lines, we don't include land cover. So partly this is because for the point I just made, power lines need to go anywhere. We can't, uh, we can't avoid whole areas because uh, there's a particular land, land cover, but also, you know, a site might be heavily forested, but only the top half is heavily forested. It would be quite possible to put a power line across the bottom. So. Um, we don't take into account the land cover, 
we based the power line assessments both on the presence of sensitive sites and of sensitive species. So this site here is the Koshu Tapu Wildlife Reserve, important bird area and protected area. Um, but it's, only, it's also home to a large number of species, many of them water bird species with a high risk of collision with power line infrastructure. And because these are distribution lines, low voltage distribution lines, they come with a risk of collision, but also a risk of electrocution. Electrocution can often be an even bigger risk. And so the assessment for distribution lines is based both on the sensitivity to collision, but also the sensitivity to electrocution. Um, if we were then to move and look at the sensitivity to transmission lines, so these are the high voltage lines looking at the same area, um, then you would see that there's only an assessment for collision because those high voltage lines tend not to pose a risk of electrocution. Now, if you have a distribution line uh, where you've taken sufficient measures to um, insulate it and make sure that there is no electrocution risk, then you could just look at the transmission line map um, then to assess just the collision risk um, of this site. What, what is missing here as well is that the, there should also be a score like there is for the wind energy of confidence. So there should be, there's something else you need to go on to the developers about, but there should be a column here showing the confidence. So again, we can say for this long list of species, we will be able to say, you know, how confident we are that each of these species are present, whether we're highly confident, moderately confident, or have a low confidence. Great. Um, Did you want to show us um, an assessment in Vietnam? Yes, so I will, uh, I will go finally to, to show Vietnam so that we've been able to look at each of our four countries. And uh, what I've done so far is I've sort of concentrated on zooming in on areas of high sensitivity um, so that I can sort of show you all of the different features and um, species that go into producing those sensitive um, assessments. Um, and but of course, you know, just as important um, of this tool, even more important is it's not just highlighting those areas which are sensitive and we need to be cautious about and maybe avoid, but it's also um, about you know, identifying areas where there's a lot of uh, development potential and we may want to consider um, developing. So here I've put on the onshore wind sensitivity for Vietnam and you can see again, you know, um, nearly 60% uh, of Vietnam is low or moderate sensitivity. So there seems to be a lot of, lot of opportunity for Vietnam to really expand uh, its, its onshore wind. When we toggle to see or remove those areas that don't have sufficient wind speed, that area comes down quite considerably, but you still have you know, a good uh, sort of 55% of the area that, is, uh, that, that could sustain renewable energy, which would be, more than sufficient to meet all of Vietnam's uh, renewable energy targets. And again, we can you know, identify a, a, a province that we're particularly interested in, this province of Gai Le, which again, um, you know, very high uh, level uh, area of uh, um, low or moderate, lots of potential that would appear in this state. And we can zoom in and see that you know the large large areas which would have seemed to be you know largely unproblematic for development. Click on one of those and see that this site um, no protected areas nearby. There are you know sensitive species that are there. Things like uh, lesser adjutant and, uh, and uh, which is a you know a vulnerable species. Asian woolly next stalk near threatened species. High sensitivity species, but actually we have low confidence about them. This area appears within their range, but it, it isn't any wetland area. So it's actually quite unlikely these species are there in any particularly large numbers. And when we look at the land cover, we can see this side is 97% cultivated land, only a few sparse bits of forest. So this is a, you know, an area that seems, um, you know, even with you know, this very high level assessment, to be an area that is unlikely to present um, um, large problems for development. And so armed with this information, 
um, it should be very easy then for uh, it's a lot a lot easier for for governments and planners to to really plan strategically about where they can optimize development of these important um, technologies and do so on a large scale whilst avoiding the kind of problems that we uh, that we want to we want to avoid. It actually almost looks like I don't know if that's solar facility over there or no agricultural lands, but yeah, you can see. Uh, this seems to be an area that would be that would, might be suitable. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Tris. I'm sure uh, what you're showing us today has, has generated a lot of questions from the audience. I'm going to hand over to Duncan, who has been monitoring the audience questions. Duncan, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tris and Beatrice. That was a really great walkthrough, and uh, I hope the sort of conversational manner of it kind of uh, helps because you know when you're if you're using the tool you'd like to kind of work out oh I want to do a project this way so understanding it and working through that way is I think was helpful so we do have a number of questions um, and we will maybe do them where we will try and put them towards Tris and Beatrice I think as it stands the majority of them will be towards Tris but Beatrice will be there ready to take on any ones which are uh, more development based. So uh, <laughs> uh, Beatrice, uh, stand by and I will uh, direct some traffic to you when 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 relevant. But uh, Tris, I think I think the majority of the questions are going to be for you. Um, so if we can start off with, um, I think some of these you've kind of touched on, but you might want to expand on a little bit more. First question we have is from Jane Brown, and she said, what is the basis of the sensitivity that you have for the different species? So um, if you can walk us through how you come up with some of those numbers for the species, I think this was related to wind. Um, if you can give us some feedback on that initially, thank you. Yeah, okay, and maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll once again, um, share my screen um, um, with you all so I can sort of, show you on a PowerPoint that I have, it might be the easiest way to do that. So if I just quickly share, share my screen uh, and then I just need to uh, switch that to um, the other view. Okay, great. Hopefully you're seeing uh, that on the screen. And so um, I'll even get a screen pointer out to point at things. So yeah, I mean, there's a very, there's a lot of methodology behind this, and so you know, uh, if you really want to understand science, uh, look at the technical manual that will be available on the website. But to try and give a brief understanding about how we go about this, um, what we do is we we create we start by creating a sensitivity index for all of the species across uh, these four countries. So what that means is we we. We score, we have an equation that we come up with where we score all of the species in terms of their, so for wind, uh, for, for instance, we score them in terms of their collision susceptibility. So scoring those species that because of their biological traits or their flight behavior are more likely to collide, uh, they get higher scores. We also score them in terms of their displacement susceptibility. So not, some species are, are, are highly susceptible to collision, some species are more wary and actually won't uh, go near um, wind farms, but that can actually cause other problems because it means that they create wind farms, create barriers to their movement or displace them from a landscape. They simply won't go into them. And that can be particularly an issue for seabirds. So often seabirds um, will just not go into an area once an array of wind farms has been built there. And if that area was a key foraging area for them and they've been denied access, that can have impacts. So we score each species based on its collision and displacement suitability, sense, uh, susceptibility, and also on its natural mortality. So some species have a low natural mortality, some of the larger birds, birds like eagles and vultures. These birds um, are slow to, to reach maturity. They only uh, breed very late. They only have a few offspring. When you have high levels of adult mor mortality caused by renewable energy uh, collisions, that can have a, a significant population impact. So we, you know, we, in, we introduce metrics that, uh, the, that, uh, for that natural mortality. Obviously, we're more, uh, the impact of collision and, and displacement is gonna be more of an issue for species that have a 
are already of conservation risk. So we bring in the IUCN red list of conservation uh, and score those species that are higher on the red list, um, more strongly than those that are low. And then we also have a metric there that looks at whether species are endemic to a particular area. So again, the loss of species that are only found in that particular area is again going to be more concerning. And so we have an algorithm that takes into account of all of that. And then we are able to provide a score for each species. We took the top 15% of species um, in each country and then used that as the basis uh, for our sensitivity index. And then we have to um, generate species distribution maps for each of those species. So we, uh, we modeled the area of suitable habitat and elevation within the known species ranges of all of those species, and then refine that with many hundreds of thousands of observational records taken from citizen science portals like eBirds and through the work we did on the ground with our partners in each of those countries. So we could really refine the known uh, range of the species. And then you overlay all of those maps with their built-in, adding up all the sensitivity scores for all of the species, and you get a species sensitivity map. And then we add to that all of the land cover data. So then we weight, as I say, uh, the, the protected areas, the IBAs, the seabird breeding colonies, the areas of coral reef and mangrove higher. So they are weighted, um, so they, um, they, they heighten the sensitivity. And then we brought in really high resolution uh, land cover data, 200 meter resolution land cover data. So we could actually find for, for each area you know exactly what habitat was there. And we scored the uh, wildlife important habitats like forest and wetland more highly. And so all of that information goes into creating the final sensitivity map that you, uh, that you saw there. And we have a different, a different algorithm uh, because there are diff slightly different uh, threats, whether it's wind farms or whether it's um, distribution lines or transmission lines or solar. So they all have different uh, methodologies that weight these, this information in slightly different ways. So I hope that um, it's sufficiently kind of a robust answer that uh, you understand, but it is a, you know, it's quite technical. So please do review um, all of the technical information that we have uh, um, when it is live on the website. Thanks for that, Chris. I think, um, yeah, one of the things that doesn't really come across because the the, the website, uh, the the Abicep is so slick at the moment is how much data has uh, gone, how much work has gone in behind this and. Um, I think one of the things maybe to mention as well is that a lot of what you're doing is sort of relatively groundbreaking in that people haven't really been thinking about uh, risks of, of wind on species like hornbills, uh, you know, because wind has largely been in, in, in places like Europe and North America and, and, you know, now more in Africa as well. So there's kind of a whole species groups where really people don't know the risks and and you've had to kind of think about that um you know for the first time so that that all is in the uh, in the work that you've done and in, and you've set that out in the the guidance when it will be there i guess right yeah yeah okay um if we can now move on to a second question is related to this but it's where does the data behind the maps come from uh, from Madly uh, Labihan. Uh, so I guess it's where, you know, how have you got data that really is ground truth and, you know, it, or is this all secondary data? Yeah, so we start with the, the, the species distribution data um, and we, BirdLife has, uh, has produced range maps for all of the uh, 11,000 bird species around the world and we're constantly refining those maps. Uh, but then we also, as I say, we, we, we collect detailed information as part of our role uh, for the IUCN Red List. We, we, uh, we collect detailed information on exactly what habitats each bird species need. And then using uh, really fine scale uh, um, how, uh, land cover data, we're able to then model those areas within the known range of the species. We actually have the known habitat preference of that uh, species and the elevation range where it occurred. So we can actually, you know, go, you know, reduce the range map to, a, to an area where it's very likely that the bird will be there. And then on top of that, we're able to kind of um, refine that with all the 
observational data. And the first point of call is, uh, is citizen science is eBirds. So there is now a platform eBirds, which is you know is really used by the birding community around the world um, as where they they save their data. I use it every time I go birding. Most of the people I know do, and it's really popular in India. Um, birding is a big pursuit in India, and eBirds is phenomenally popular there. And eBirds generates you know a million conservation records every every year. It, 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 it's really a huge amount of data. So we've pulled in all of that data, but we also because we have our partners on the ground in each of these countries who are the ornithological experts and have at their disposal huge amounts of data, we've had them compiling for the two years we've been working on this. They've been compiling all of the relevant data. So. Our partner in India would be compiling all the data from the road surveys for vultures they do, all the, uh, the Asian wetland bird survey data, pulling all of that in, all of the busted surveys and all of the surveys that they do, compiling all of that information and also going out and doing bespoke surveys in areas they believe are understudy. And so we actually pull together you know, many, many um, hundreds of thousands of observational records, which allowed us to kind of really refine that distribution um, uh, and and uh, uh, and also be able to give you that measurement of how confident we are about the species being there, which is a really important thing. You know, not every species that we that we list will actually occur in that square, but you have a very clear idea of where you know uh, 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 of of the ones that most certainly will and those that won't. Um, so we have all of that that data, uh, and then we have the site data. So we. BirdLife itself maintains a database of important bird areas. We've systematically around the world using a systemized approach identified uh, using you know, criteria that are consistent around the world, identified the most important places for birds. Uh, that has been done by all of our four partners in that, that, those countries. So we pull in that, that layer. We take the protected area, official protected area layers from the World Protected Area Database. Um, we've done additional work where for the seabirds, we identified every, with ornithological experts, we identified all of the breeding colonies in the areas of ocean that we covered, and then, and then worked out what the, um, the foraging radii for the species present there would be, so what area around each colony was being utilised. Uh, we bring, as I said, we bring in data on coral reefs, on mangroves, on lots of other things, and importantly, we have the habitat data, and so this is Satellite uh, um, satellite data, which uh, that, that turns ha habitat into different habitat, uh, habitat categories at a very fine 200 meter resolution. So we have a good understanding with it of where all the habitat is at any square, and because we know which habitats are more sensitive, and those you know like agricultural land and urban areas and wastelands which are less sensitive we can score them appropriately. And so all of this information combined goes into making this, uh, these assessments, which is what make us kind of confident that uh, these are robust assessments. And again, because we've got our partners on the ground in these countries, they can sort of ground truth it for us. They are the experts and we've done a lot of work with them to make sure that we've calibrated these assessments and that we're happy that they're coming out. Bearing in mind, we've also tried to be precautionary in the assessments because We'd rather sort of be overly cautious with this high level assessment uh, than, uh, than not so. Um, so whilst, you know, there is always the caveat that none of this replaces a, an on the ground environmental impact, impact assessment, you ultimately do need to do that, um, but you'll have a much better understanding and you're far likely to be doing those impact assessments in, in lower risk areas where you find less problems if you use this map early on it does provide a really useful early assessment. Thanks, Tris. Um, I think also if you're a lender, um, it will be help with getting your approval and your financing, um, you know, it will make projects much more, um, you know, approvable if you like, because they're in the right place. And that's one of the reasons we, we've been championing the tool. Um, next question, I think you've kind of answered this one already. Uh, but it's just um, from a Amy Upgren. Uh, what areas are used for high sensitivity areas? Are KBAs included as high, very high sensitivity areas? Uh, yeah, so to, to arrive in the high sensitivity uh, category, it can be that if it has a, high, a number of uh, um, a very highly, um, uh, highly sensitive species, that will put it in the very high 
category, as well as uh, certain combinations of very high, highly sensitive habitat types. But everywhere that is a protected area or an IVA, an important bird area, automatically goes into the, the very highest category. We've kept it to important bird areas rather than key biodiversity areas uh, because it's the avian uh, sensitive mapping tool. Um, and we wanted to kind of be clear that, you know, we were making this sense assessment for birds. Um, but the reality is actually, you know, there's a, you know, birds are highly indicative of, uh, of wider wildlife. Many of those um, IBAs actually are, are also where the key KBAs are, and KBAs haven't been comprehensively ass assessed in, in many countries of the world where IBAs are pretty much comprehensively assessed everywhere. Um, and things like the land cover data and, uh, and things is equally important for other, other taxes. So this does give you an, uh, um, an assessment of biodiversity importance wider than, uh, than just birds. But because we're sort of we are, you know, we are the global expert on birds. We've been keen to 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 make sure it was seen as a, a primarily a bird assessment, and that's why IVAs as opposed to KBAs. Thanks, Tris. Um, that's very helpful. So um, I've got a double question here from uh, Santosh Bajagain. Uh, first off, can users download the land use cover data or transmission line distribution data? And secondly. Um, how the data on bird distribution might be available for users. Similarly, uh, the IUCN species distribution range map or in other formats. Can you show any bird distribution on the tool for Nepal uh, with transmission line distribution, if possible? <laughs> so a few things to unpack there. Yeah, so in terms of sort of downloadability of the data, um... You can't. You can out. You can output the uh, the the assessment, which gives you you know the assessment, the full list of all the, of the species, their level of sensitivity, how confident they are occurring that site, and what protected areas and IBAs are there, as well as a, that full breakdown of the land cover um, and the explanation of you know why that site falls into that category. Um, you can't download or take away any of uh, of the raw data. There are a few reasons for that. I mean, partly, you know, there are a lot of caveats around this data. Um, so I think it's important that when you see it through the Avastep tool, you're not just seeing the kind of the data, but you're also seeing it within the context of being able to see the explanation of, and the caveats. And so we're sort of, we're cautious about divorcing that data from, um, uh, from the, the website where, you know, where you get to this sort of contextual understanding. And then secondly, I mean, a lot of these data layers, there are sort of existing um, um, protections on their usage. So we're sort of strongly affiliated with IBAT, which is the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, uh, where, which is now used by businesses around the world as the sort of the preeminent screening tool for sites. And that does allow you to download all of the information, to download all of the species ranges, to download uh, the, the IBA polygons, to, to download all of those sorts of things. But it does so for a kind of a, a particular funding model, which is designed to, to enable, to, to, to make sure that we can maintain these important data sets. So, so it, it's advised that people wanting to download some of that data go, um, go directly to, to IBAT, or come to the sort of the BirdLife website and where you can, you can request um, species range maps, uh, IBA boundaries, uh, and the like. Um, and there are some um, provisions around access to that. Um, and I think that that's also one of the reasons why we're shying away from directly showing the direct boundary of a protected area or a species range on the map as well, because you know those are things that are that, that sort of. Um, the, the, the spread over the territory that is is IBAT. So uh, so um, so 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 that's what's available at the moment. But this is the first phase of development for the first few countries, and so we're actually you know we're we're really keen to kind of get end user feedback on the kind of additional information they'd like to see. So in the next you know few months as we roll this out and we talk to end users, we're very keen to kind of get their ideas. Well, actually, it'd be really nice to have this functionality, or it'd be nice to see this. So we're actually keen to hear all about those ideas and we will bear them in mind for the next phase of development. Thanks, Tris. Um, I think I, that's so I, I may have answered part of the question. Did I answer all the questions? 
Lost well, track. I think you I think you wrapped it up because I think uh, the question was about can you download data, um, and you know even if if you're focusing on a particular country, um, the answer is still the same. Um, but I think um, Santosh, in terms of Nepal, I think when 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 the mapper goes live, you will be able to get in there and have a look at um, specifically on transmission lines of a country. And as Tris said, if you're if there's particular species or protected areas, et cetera, you can reach out to the relevant um, organizations to try and get that information. Um, moving on to the next question by uh, Bob Dobius. Um, this actually occurred to me when I first had a look at this map. Um, so I, I was thinking maybe you could use this for other things as well. It doesn't have to be the particular sectors that you, you we're, we're focusing on. So Bob's asking that question. He's saying, um, does BirdLife have uh, or are you planning to create similar tools, type of tools for other development sectors? Um, but I was just thinking to myself, maybe you could use this already for other development sectors. If you, if, if the case is you're clearing land um, for particular development, that the information there would be useful if to find out you know what birds are there and is the area sensitive or not um but anyway Tris, if you have any thoughts on that that would be very helpful Thank yeah you. certainly i mean you know the assessments for uh, as i was saying the assessments for for wind energy and for power lines are tailored very much to the to the bird species that are impacted and that's how you get your assessment but for solar pv where you know um Obviously, there's the big impact on species, but there, there isn't sort of a recognized um, group of species that are, are more impacted. You know, whatever species are there are going to be impacted, um, not some species and not others. They'll all be impacted by having a, a, a solar facility placed there. And so because of that, we have used the, the, data, the information we know about the sites. So um, we've used the information on whether or not there's any protected area, IBA there, or whether indeed, or what the land cover is there. And so if there's high biodiversity value land cover, um, that generates uh, a higher sensitivity. And so that really could be used for anything. I mean, if you're, wh whatever, you you know, whatever you're wanting an assessment of, this, you know, this will tell you, you know, um, within that square, is it um, a site that's protected or an IBA and, is the uh, the land cover, the habitat um, noteworthy uh, from a wildlife point of view? And so, yes, it could be used um, for a wide range of things uh, in that sense. I think one of the reasons why I mean, we, we've uh, you know we've we've um, we've designed this as uh, as as an answer to the need for for rapidly expanding renewable energy. And so, there's a particular there's a particular problem with renewable energy that we have in a very short space of time if we are to uh, to address climate change, have to find a lot of energy infrastructure, and uh, and, uh, and so there's a there's a, a lot of a lot of areas needed very swiftly, and that's the question we're trying to address. And also with wind and solar, one of the good things about them and what makes them such promising technology is there's a lot of scope. So we can see um, across these countries that actually a lot of the area is either suitable for wind and or solar. So there's a lot of scope for choosing between sides. Um, and that may not be the case with other, uh, other industries. You know, you can only put a, a coal mine where there are uh, coal resources, or you can only put a dam where there's, you know, certain places on certain types of river. And so there's far less um, um, possibility for kind of spatial um, planning, but there's so much possibility with renewables for getting the spatial planning right and so much importance in doing so in order to make things safe that that's why these are the industries we're particularly interested in. Thanks, Tris. I think it's also important that we, you know, we want to be part of the solution. We believe in the transition. And so finding helping with that uh, transition by with using this tool is, is kind of uh, the, 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 you know, the, the message we want to come across. Um, Next question um, from May uh, Velas Swarin. Um, hi, May. Um, so, how long does it take to add countries? How can we scale up? What are the plans uh, moving forward? For example, 
um, in the, the regional flyway initiative, we would, uh, she's uh, saying we would love to have a, a lot of the East Asia, Australasia flyway uh, countries covered. So um, what's your thoughts on that and how long does it take? And, and is that the plan to scale up? Thank you. Yeah, we've designed this very much with the hope that it's going to become global in scope and that we can rapidly expand it. It's very much the way that uh, that the thinking about renewables is going. So if you look at all the best practice guidance that's been produced by the IUCN and others, it, it, it makes the central point that good renewable energy expansion starts with good spatial planning and sensitivity mapping. The European Union, uh, in response to the, uh, the crisis brought about by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is, is currently reconsidering its renewable energy policy and looking at how we can rapidly ex expand renewable energy in Europe. And it, and it has concluded that sensitivity mapping has a key role to play in that. So we're going to see sensitivity mapping um, um, grow uh, and um, around the world. And therefore, you know, you know, we want uh, our step to grow as well. I think we're, ADB and BirdLife are sort of ahead of the game on this. We've sort of um, leading the way on this, which is very nice. But um, um, and so we hope with ADB and others, we continue to expand in Asia. But we also, you know, want this to be used across the world, particularly in in emerging markets where there's perhaps low nature regulation and where um, this tool could make a big a big difference. So particularly sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, there's a lot of opportunity. And so, yeah, we uh, we're already in discussions with ADB about where we can take it in Asia, but we're all also looking for for supporters and partners around the rest of the world and. Um, and the thing is, now we have this methodology in place, and we've deliberately designed a methodology that we think is applicable globally. Now that we have the platform built, we should be able to add countries uh, fairly swiftly. It's just a matter of, uh, of resource, and we can build up our team here um, to accommodate any scale of development. So I think, you know, uh, um, if we can get the resourcing, we can actually do this very quickly and add countries very quickly. Some countries are more challenging than others, you know, um, depending on the size of the country and the complexity of some of the issues it's a lot easier as i've said if we've got a bird life partner in the country because that's a really critical help to have that local ornithological expertise but luckily bird life has partners in in many of the world's countries and where it doesn't it has key ornithological partners anyway so i think you know there's really nowhere in the world that we're that we don't want to do this and and we can do it fast and we need to do it fast because you know, these are the these really this decade and the next the, the few to come are going to be the critical decades. And we want Avistep to really underpin the next couple of decades worth of renewable energy transition. Thanks, Tris. Um, yeah, that's that's great to hear. And um, yeah, I, I would encourage anybody to reach out to myself or or, or Tris to you know if you have interest to you can involve with scaling up. Um, moving on to the next question from Melissa Manguiat. Uh, Melissa has asked, is there a function to pin several uh, wind power projects locations at the same time to compare options during feasibility study? Um, Tris, have you got any feedback on that? Yeah, so you can, uh, you can certainly look at I mean, I explained how uh, you could put in a, a site or a grid reference and zoom straight to a, a location very, uh, very easily. And then you can, when you've got a site, it's very easy to save that URL and to, and to share that directly um, so that the, a person can see exactly what you're looking at, but also you can produce that uh, report. So, whereas, you know, I mean, you could have, you could, you could always have three windows open and you can always go to three sites or four sites with however many, uh, windows you want to open on your browser and then click between them and, and compare them. But you can also very easily go to your three different sites and uh, output an assessment and then, you know, send those, that, they, they come out as a PDF and you can send three PDFs and say, share those with colleagues and say, these are the three sites under, um, under consideration. Site A um, comes out of Abistet with a, with a sensitivity of 52% as in the moderate category site. B came out very high with 100% sensitivity and site C came out as uh, low sensitivity with 23% sensitivity. Here are the reports on why that is. You know, let's discuss next week where we want to prioritize. And so it, it should be very easy to make those, those, uh, those um, 
um, considerations between a number of different sites. Thanks, Tris. I think that's helpful. I mean, I can imagine myself, uh, you know, producing a few reports and then looking through to see which one is the, the best one. Um, I remember doing that actually back in uh, on doing a project for the British Telecom, comparing sites for potential wind farms a long time ago. Um, I think we've had the next couple of questions we've actually already answered. So maybe because uh, Tambui had uh, actually, uh, one of hers was answered, I might jump to her next one. And since Beatrice has been uh, um, not copying many of the questions, perhaps I'll, uh, I'll direct this one to her. So Beatrice, um, from an ADB perspective, perhaps, if a project area falls within a, the high or very high sensitivity zone, does that mean that the project area is likely considered critical habitat? What would you say on that uh, from your perspective? As yeah, I guess. Uh, thanks, Tam Bui. Um, I think this tool is very useful to screen sites. Um, what would be important it would be to see what, what factors were taken into consideration to consider that area high sensitivity, for example. So, um, you know, some ADB's critical habitat definition differs slightly from other IFI's critical habitat definitions. Um, so if, for example, we have a protected area and that's why, you know, the sensitivity of that, that uh, um, five kilometer square area is high sensitivity, then for us, that would trigger critical habitat requirements straight up straight away. Otherwise, I think there's still room for doing um, the full critical habitat assessment. Would you agree with that, Tris? Yes. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. I, I think it's still necessary to do to do that. It's to be going to get the uh, you know a good steer in in the direction of what you're going to need to consider um, through this tool. Um, definitely. Thanks. Thanks both on that one. I think, um, you know, it, 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 what the thing that I see the value of this as well, one of the main, the values is it can give you a steer so you can give an early indication to, to somebody to say, you know, like that one is potential, you know, high potential for critical habitat and that one is not. So maybe we should focus on the one that is not. Uh, and that's, you know, where we get that upstream planning. Um, element. Um, so next question we have from uh, David Wilson. I guess David was looking at your map of Thailand and he saw uh, something in relation to Gurney's Pitta there I, I, I'm going to take a stab at. And he's asked, are you able to explain the logic behind not considering species in solar risk, e.g. a forest cell with Gurney's Pitta is more, much more important than otherwise equal cell without? Um, mm. So have you got any thoughts on that one, Tris? Yeah, no, that's... Uh, so I've sort of, I've touched on this a little bit, but I think, so, you know, as David knows that for, for wind energy and for, you know, uh, power lines, there is, uh, there is, you know, huge difference in what species are more susceptible to to, uh, to collide or indeed be dis displaced by them. So not all bird species within an area um, are equally affected um, by collision. There's some things that are much more sensitive and a lot of, uh, uh, of effort has gone into defining those. We now know that quite well. And we've developed, uh, we've been involved in some sort of seminal papers um, where all the traits of known collision fatalities uh, around the world have been sort of computated and we've been able to therefore and extrapolate it to other non taxa like things like hornbills and parrots, which haven't been the recipients of that kind of study because so much of the effort is in Europe and North America, and come up with like lists of which species are more susceptible to collision uh, with power lines or with, um, or with uh, wind farms. And the same isn't true of solar. There aren't, no one can say, oh, this group of birds are more likely to collide um, with solar. As I said, there's a small suggestion from North America that there may be some water birds who, who, uh, who look at 
uh, when flying above large arrays of solar panels, see it as a water body and get confused and fly towards it. But the evidence on that being a global phenomenon is yet not is not really there. So, so it's not really a, a you know it's really it's a habitat kind of impact. It's a footprint impact. Is what you know what biodiversity do you impact by putting the uh, the wind farm there? So I suppose we could have continued you know still not had any measurements of of susceptibility uh, to, to collision or displacement in there, but just brought in, you know, what are the red list species or what are the endemic species and, and weighted those slightly. But we felt that that was really, it was covered by the kind of habitat. So the areas with the Gurney's pitters are gonna be the areas of high quality forest um, and those areas, the sensitivity is captured by the forest. So, um, and also most of the area, you know, many of the, you know, those areas will be already identified as IBAs and protected areas. So it was felt that with the solar, because it was primarily this footprint uh, uh, issue, that the best way to address that is by, by, by building the sensitivity off the sensitivity of the underlying habitat uh, and in addition to any other sites there. Um, but I think it's you know it's an interesting point and and uh, and and something worth us uh, reflecting on. Thanks, Tris. Um, I think I, I think some of us who work in kind of you know um, lender finance, you know, we we kind of also use this sort of habitat focused model as well. With you know we we say is it critical habitat? Is it natural habitat? And that defines how we sort of think about areas and space if you like if they trigger something or not um i think as well with species like gurney's pitta um and other pitters we know really not a huge amount about their ecology in terms of you know migration and so on and i mean you know i know uh, you know that pitters fly at night quite often when they're migrating and they are attracted to light and things like that but um you know how the effect of wind, etc., might affect them is something that is not so known. So I guess as time goes by, we'll be able to refine those models and those areas as well. Just is that kind of your take on it as well? Yes. Yeah. And the idea is that these models can be refined as our knowledge grows um, and we understand these things better. So you know, though there does need to, you know, these are the best these models can be on our current understanding, um, but we need a lot more research into collision. And when we kind of, you know, start getting more more research, particularly from these parts of the world, we'll be able to kind of refine these models and uh, and change them as we go. Thanks for that, Chess. Um, I've just got two more questions, really. Um, so we're actually pretty good on the time. Um, first one is another one from Jane Brown. Um, which is asking, does the distribution information include the migratory pathways offshore? Chris, over to you. Uh, was that the migratory pathways offshore? Offshore, um, Yeah. The reality is that, you know, we simply don't know enough about the migratory routes that seabirds are taking. We have and we know a little in some parts of the world uh, because of satellite tracking data and BirdLife maintains the largest database of seabird tracking data that there is. Um, and in some parts of the world, we've been able to use that to sort of understand migration routes, but there is very, there, there is insufficient um, um, satellite tracking data in, in Asia to really pinpoint migration routes. Um, and so the uh, the maps for, for offshore, uh, you know, are, are a bit more tricky to put together because one, we you know, we don't have that um, clear data on where uh, the really the, the routes are, and uh, two, there isn't a lot of observational data. So as I said, there's a you know, there's a growing amount of observational data, both from citizen science and from all the on onshore surveys that take place onshore, but uh, there there isn't uh, offshore much observational data. So our maps there have had to be based um, solely on the on the uh, range maps of the, the species. What we tried to do to improve that was then, as I say, do that exercise of identifying the key colonies. And so we worked with ornithologists in the region to identify the key, key colonies. And then we looked at each species present there and worked with experts to determine what 
the, uh, the sort of maximum known uh, foraging radii around that would be. We took the species with the highest foraging radii and we made that the area around each colony that we sort of buffered and put in, in a high category. Um, that I think, you know, brought in a level of improvement. Um, and then obviously we included these other biological factors like coral reefs, seagrass and uh, mangroves, which, uh, which are other kind of important um, areas. So, so yeah, there's a lot more data that it would be nice to have for offshore to make these maps more robust. It's clearly, you know, there are a lot more provisional uh, assessments offshore than they are onshore. But we were pleased by some of the patterns that came out of them. Actually, talking to experts in the region, they do seem to make kind of sense. We expected, for example, to have uh, more sensitivity, you know, inshore and in intertidal regions. We expected um, certain, you know, uh, more sensitivity sort of in southern waters. Um, um, and a lot of those patterns did co come out. So I think the maps for offshore are, um, are still very, very kind of useful and, and very novel. Um, but yeah, there, there are there, there are just a lot of missing data that would be nice to have. Thanks for that, Tris. Um, and I think you know that's something that's really kind of groundbreaking that offshore element that's never been done in some of these countries. Uh, uh, so that's great that we've got that done. Um, I've just got uh, one last question. So if anybody else has any questions, feel uh, please still feel free to drop them in. But the one last one we have is how often will the Abistet platform be updated and maintained with the most recent data? Yeah, that's a good, uh, um, that's a good question. And I, I don't think we have an exact answer for that now. It'll depend a little bit on, on the funding we're able to bring in and how that, that enables us to keep it updated. But what we've tried to do is design the tool in a way that it's easy for us to go in and make those changes. So we, we've worked with a web developer to kind of get a system where um, putting in new data isn't actually, it's quite straightforward. Um, there are also different layers of data. So there are things like red list assessments. You know, we, we assess um, the world's birds for their conservation status every year and update the red list. Hopefully things like that will be able to bring in the new red list um, status when they change and how that changes the algorithm. We'll be able to change, bring that in fairly frequently, maybe, you know, after each and every red list update. Um, our range maps change every so often, IBA boundaries change. Hopefully, periodically, we'll be being able to bring those in at least every two or three years. Maybe sort of every five or more years, be able to do a sort of big assessment where we sort of uh, pull in all of the uh, all of the new eBird data and observational data that's built up in the, in the last five years and add that into the tool. But I think we're going to have to yeah, sit down and think about our update cycle. And it will depend on, you know, yeah, on on how on how successful other step is and how much uh, resourcing we're able to generate for it. And and hopefully if it, if it's the success we hope it is and it's used as, as much uh, as it is, then we'll be able to kind of have a good long term funding for it and, and make sure it's updated regularly. Thanks, Tris. Well, let's hope so. And um, I, I... Well, Kate McEwen, um, Kate, I, I accidentally tried to answer your question, but um, it's one that we've already covered, which is, are we trying to scale up to other parts of the world? Absolutely, uh, we would love to. Um, and that is 100% the intention. So that will be what we plan to do. Uh, so I think that was the last question that we had. So um, that means it's probably a good time for us to wrap up the session. So. Um, I should firstly say a huge thanks to Tris uh, for giving us the demo session today and Beatrice for facilitating that. So thank you both to you. Tris, you've had a very long day starting at 2 a.m. And Beatrice, it's now late in the evening for you. So thank you for staying up and facilitating. And sorry, I didn't have any more questions to, to pass on to you. Um, and uh, I should really also say a big thanks to, um, you know, a few people here. Uh, first off, the audience, um, there's still quite a sizable number of people who've stayed till the very end. So much appreciated. And thanks to any of you who also uh, contributed for the Q&A. Uh, I need to say a big thanks to the Korean government, the E-Asia Fund for financing uh, the, the development of the Abhiset tool. 
Um, I need to say a big thanks to the BirdLife team, Tris, Quan, Dingley and Sue, and the BirdLife partners in the different countries who've helped put this together uh, to make it such a, a fantastic tool. As well as um, AD, my ADB team who've helped me, we've had uh, Maya, Victor, Isao, Beatrice here today, uh, Bruce and Ching Feng, my boss as well. And a thanks to the ASEF team who've allowed us to showcase the launch of the tool today. And a special thanks also to Emma Marston who helped kick off this process uh, when we when we first started talking to BirdLife about this in the uh, CMS conference back in 2017. So thanks again to you, Emma. Um, just one last remark to say. Um, we will be launching, uh, Tris, maybe you can say when we're going to be uh, launching roughly. Um, what we can do is for anybody who's participated in this event uh, and those who registered but uh, weren't able to maybe attend, uh, we will send out an email blast to you uh, when the tool goes live. We've got the email addresses for everybody who, um, who uh, registered here. So we will send out an email blast um, with that. And Tris, what's what's the ETA, do you think, um, so you can give people, and um, if you can, maybe you can just drop, to, to reward those wonderful people who've stayed to the very end, maybe you can actually put into the, type into the uh, chat function, the, uh, the web address, so that people can perhaps uh, be able to uh, see it before we leave. Uh, so when is it likely to go live? And um, yeah, that will be a nice way to finish. If, over to you, Tris. Uh, yeah, so as I say, the site is already uh, there. If you go to it, but you'll just go to the homepage and say coming soon. So you can go there and bookmark that and, and have it. And I'll just um, put in the chat um, the link now. So oh, that, I might have just send that to hosts and panelists. So let me see if I can do <laughs> everyone. There we go. I hope you're seeing that. Yeah. Aristotle.birdlife.org. And so, yes, you can go there now and you can watch the, uh, the globe spinning around uh, uh, <laughs> for as much of your time as you like. Uh, but the full website is waiting on a few final things and we think mid-July. Um, so just a, a few more weeks now and uh, by mid-July it should be up and running and hopefully yeah, we'll give people every, everyone a heads up ahead of that so that people can go and check it out. Great. Thanks so much, Tris, and uh, thanks again to everybody for joining today and really appreciate that and uh, have a wonderful evening. Um, with that, I can close the session. Thank you all. Thank you. See if it was a way of uh, me stopping it for participants and just keeping us on, but I'm not sure. But people are slowly dropping off. But uh, yeah, I can stop the recording, Tress, if you like. Yeah, I'll press stop recording. Are you sure you want to stop recording to the cloud? Yes.